Uh, this is, I'm, I'm eight years out of academia and I used to be machine systems. So this has been huge fun. Uh, Sider, thanks for organizing the conference. Thank you for all uh, the organizers. Okay, so as I go, my title says we're the talking about Git is for data. I am your and co-founder at a company called Z Data, uh, but the work here is um, a long list of kind of uh, eight people who were a uh, company. This is a uh, uh, joint effort among a big team. Right. So let's begin by talking about code collaboration. What does it mean to collaborate on code? And code versioning has an extensive history, and through decades of exploration we have learned about the best practices on how to collaborate with code. And like it or love it, Git is the de facto standard for source control today, right? And whether you use GitHub, whether you understand rebase or you don't understand rebase, it is the standard. However, what does it mean to do collaboration on data? What about data collaboration? First, we have to define data. Now I gotta take a very, very broad definition of data. It's just any collection of bytes with value, right? So really beyond unstructured or unstructured, or structured, this would be any collection of bytes which you care about. Right? And while data storage has certain scale up well in terms of Hadoop, um, uh, or others, other other kind of systems and all that, but if you think about how how data collaboration was today, it really is not very different from just doing copy and paste. Really, if you want to like build a share a report among people and you want this, everyone can reproduce it reliably, you want to run some experiments, work with a friend, work with someone who, and you want to be able to work on it without having someone else write your thing. Uh, you want to create a new version and in a way so that everyone else who is still touching data do not uh, uh, still seize their old thing uh, or their original copies. What you do is basically make your own copy, right? And finally, data is rarely standalone. In games, interactive media, or even applications which are using machine learning models in there, I may have people and they have other things like assets or machine models in there. If I'm doing uh, machine learning modeling together with my data, I probably need code to interpret, describe how to use the data, or maybe I have notebooks and other things like analyzing it. Right? So how do solutions work today if I've both code and data together in the same repository? Right? I'm just gonna talk quickly about Git LFS. So there's a very common solutions today. Uh, and we'll just spend a little time just to show how it works. I have a, have a repository of things and I have a, a parquet following it. I will first tell give, get, get LFS a pattern to use, maybe start a parquet. And when I add the file, it goes from binary to a process called git clean release, we might call it dehydrate, into something called a pointer file. And this is just a reference to the, uh, the file, actual file gets uploaded to LFS server. And then when I ask someone else to do a clone or a checkout, the, uh, this is the pointer file is downloaded and the inverse process, which is called smudge, release it actually downloads the data from the LFS server and uh, it's like the original binary data. Right. Okay. So apart from Git LFS, you may also have heard other things like Git DBC, Git NX, and so on. But they are really all architecture similar and are based upon a very basic principle. All problems in computer science can be solved by another level of directing. Right. And that is really I just have Git store pointers that go elsewhere. Right. And if and the, really this is really annoying because it requires explicit space decisions, decisions by the person using it. And really, if you think about it, it's not very different from just having a download manifest and running curl operations, right? But and what, what we think is that data will be first class, and this is really why we built ZHub. Right. Now, what ZHub is under the hood comprises of a couple of pieces. We have a Git server because Git, and then there is a content address store which you can scale out and provides caching, and you can deploy cheaply anywhere. Right. And on top of that, set up web front end, think about it as a GitHub equivalent, right? but more specialized for data capabilities. And there's a web extension, which integrates with Git that provides a client Git integration piece. And really this is the piece we're gonna focus on and, and understand how this integrates with all the rest of the ecosystem. Right. So what is the Git extension? So we, what we provide is full Git compatibility. You can just add big files, small files, any files, you just use git commands, nothing else. Um, 
we can run almost every esoteric command we have tested. We kind of just work. Uh, so, and this, and this is merely a UX change, right? This is really a th thing about it. It's more about uniform UX that code and data are all treated identically. So how does uh, uh, this work behind the scenes? Really, we are just using the same clean as much pub like everyone else. However, a key aspect which makes a big difference, really a big difference in practice is that we capture everything, right? And we just like, you know, we have, uh, we have file systems, which optimize by performance. Uh, you know, if you have very small files, you just store in I know data structures. We do something similar, right? We have a data informed heuristic to determine what's the best performing storage location for each file that would give us the best performance, whether that's uh, storing it straight into Git, having Git manage it for us, or having uh, uh, having our own storage mechanism manage it for us. So uh, if you have not seen uh, read the read about Git pack files, they are really really amazing. That's kind of how they uh, how they are very efficient at compressing and doing source code. So how do we do something similar for arbitrary binary data? Right. So let's take a look. What happens if we try to store large file.bin? What happens when we store a big binary file? We have a big, big binary file. The first thing that happens is a process called content defined chunking. Maybe, uh, you may be familiar with it. If not, we have a quick overview. So, what happens is that we perform a rolling hash function on this. It's going to be over the data. And then a simple termination condition on rolling hash is used. Say, for instance, hash 116624 to determine a chunk boundary, right? And what this in this simple condition here does is just it says that my average chunk size will be about 16K, right? And then we take a cut and then we repeat, right? And so now our, our chunk file is chunked into a bunch of pieces. Now, this is why we do the content defined chunking procedure is that it's robust to insertions and deletions on chunk boundaries as those are decided based on the data. If you have inserted new things, the chunk boundaries are generally kind of similar. Right, so question to ask of course is what's the target chunk size? If you have small chunks, we get better dedupe because you, it's easier to find similar chunks around. But larger chunks are much more efficient to store Right, and manage in a distributed system, and it saves on network I/O and all that. Right, so can we get the best of both worlds? And so this is the next part of it, which is the first thing we do to build the thing about building a Merkle tree out of these chunks. Each chunk is first hashed with a strong cryptographic hash because the rolling hash is not particularly strong. I will not go into the details of this structure here, but basically it's called a mechanism called content of Merkle tree, which is a more generally a non-binary tree. There's a nice added property that again, once again, insertions and deletions don't, don't rewrite the entire tree, right? They, uh, they may only rewrite a small part of the tree. Next, say this is actually an insert uh, an append, and I actually just appended four blocks to it. Right, and now we could store each of them separately, but that's a lot of overhead if I were to just store four small 16K chunks. Instead, we simply concatenate the chunks together and store them in the content address store. And of course, we can also concatenate and other, from other file changes. And practically, we just keep accumulating until we accumulate up to 16 megabytes and store as a single block. Now, of course, since the rest of the chunks must have been at some point inserted in the system, previously it must also have been part of some other block. And this is, is exactly how we reconstruct this file. So to reconstruct this file, we pull some subrange from a block from one block and some kind of another block and just concatenate them together. So the outcome is that we kind of achieve the best of both books. We have achieved data dedupe with small chunks, with some of both small insertions and deletions anywhere in the file. And we have low storage overhead because we have large block sizes. And also importantly as well, it's a very high data locality. If a range in a block is required, it's much very likely that the rest of the blocks are required because they are part of the same commit, they're part of the same change, change set. Right, so we tested this on this uh, data set called the COVID 19 data set, right? And what, uh, what this data set is a time evolving collection of COVID 19 papers with full text, authors, abstracts, and a bunch of document embeddings. Right? And uh, the first snapshot we tested is about 32 gigabytes. We just get add, get commit, get push, and create a commit, and we repeat a few times. And really, we take the last 50 commits in this in this data set, and we uh, okay, 50, 50 versions here. So we can show 
what uh, what happens with kind of different different processes. So naively, if we were to just store all these fifty versions independently, it's about two point four five terabytes. If you just if you use Git, use Git LFS, or really this is true for any file level dedupe system, where our, our DVC will be similar as a few other a few others, this is only five gigabytes. And, we can, we can store it in about 287 gigabytes or about 2x smaller. Our chunker is pretty dumb. It really just does this simple rolling hash scan. But if we specifically add a little bit of modification to it to prefer new lines in the CSV file, right? So we can actually tune this chunker for different file types. And that ends up reducing this to about 87 gigabytes. Now, is this really particularly interesting to us? Because let's just repeat this, that the CSV chunk is about 7 gigabytes. And if you pay really, really close attention to the card 19 slide, you will notice a final snap cell size is 81.5 gigabytes. And of course, the first 87 gigabytes is really representation of all 50 versions. And so we only need 5.5 gigabytes more for all of the other 49 historical versions. And really, this is a game changer. And this is... Uh, really why data dedupe is, fun is functionally really fundamentally important for machine learning data sets, right? Because a lot of things, operations, whether you're appending to it, whether you're doing random splits or data subsets, all those things can be massively optimized by having good data dedupe, right? So are we done? Unfortunately, no, because this is unfortunately something you don't really want to do. If you have a terabyte repo, you probably don't want to get cloned or forever to download, right? And so we have an and, and piece. So uh, thinking about, or thinking more about what does it mean to interact with repos, we think the best solution is to provide a virtual file system. And it allows you to kind of explore large data sets in seconds, for instance, it has a line 400M data set, uh, 34 gigabytes of party files of URLs and various metadata, right? And in one command, you may mount that to your local system, which you can then explore and access and explore with whatever tools you want, open that in Finder and so on. And for this particular, uh, for a case of the line data set, where we just, because it's a parquet file, uh, we can do columnar queries without downloading everything, without testing every row. Uh, so we uh, did this at about one gigabyte downloaded to get a license distribution. And this is about 2% of the data set, right? And the first, down, the first operation is kind of about, depends on how fast your internet is. But after that, it's pretty much, uh, we, we, there's a lot of local uh, caching happening, which is, is basically as fast as local file system after the first access. So what the virtual file system provides is the ability to bridge between machine learning experimentation and machine production. Your same code, which you're running on a laptop, works in the cluster. And also, if people over here have a way machine learning, if I were to run distributed jobs, I always have to think hard about what am I downloading to each machine, right? Now just mount and go for it because we're streaming down the to it. You don't have to worry about data partitioning. Uh, and of course, there's read-only. We, we are working on writable mounts, and this is the next level of that. And they essentially you have a mount of a virtual file system that has the same semantics and acts exactly like Git repo. And another thing thinking about is Dropbox with Git semantics. Right. So this is kind of uh, what we're building, set up. So we have full Git compatibility where they and code are both first-class citizens. Uh, where there's high-performance dedupe architecture to handle cheap versioning and common machine learning data set operations and the virtual file system to have scaling to terabytes, terabyte size repos and beyond. Now, all these are awesome, I think, anyway, <laughs> but, that's, but that's not you know, the biggest takeaway uh, I'll, let, I'll let you leave here, right? So what we think is that many machine learning, ops, there's an area of, uh, of ML ops where people come up with uh, new methods to deal with machine learning and uh, how to collaborate and work on those things are pretty much exactly DevOps concepts data quality monitoring. That's continuous integration. If we can store all the data in a repo, data pipelines, we have done things like similar, which are the build dependencies. Uh, the versioning, continuous integration, build artifacts, right? There's a lot of, a lot of similarities. So perhaps, perhaps, maybe ML ops is the DevOps skill with a large scale of data. 
Right. And what we have, what, uh, what we are exploring here is whether does it take to scale the foundations? I think we are demonstrating that we are able to scale the foundations of this piece. But then, of course, there is still very, a lot more work to be done. Much, much more work to be done. Today, we kind of scale to about a terabyte on range. We have some designs in place to think about how do we scale this up to over 100 terabytes in a single repo. We talk about writable mounts. And also, something which is important as well is collaboration patterns. So GitHub, we talk about Git, but GitHub itself has defined a lot of collaboration patterns, code, pull requests, issues, and all that. What are the right patterns for data? That is a little bit of an open question. Uh, because you probably don't want to look at a 50,000 line diff of a, a 10 gigabyte CSV file. That's not very meaningful. You probably want something else like automatic visualizations, looking at, uh, looking at outliers and so on. So there's a, uh, and I will stop here and, and take questions.